You can't fish right where the, the site's at because the land, the land's contaminated and stuff. But you don't cut off a man's life at 33. Every man, woman, and child who works in this nation has got to know that he, is, he or she is handling hazardous material or that they're being exposed to it. Environmentalists and organized labor have always worried about their children. And I think most of us worry about a job because we want things better for our children. We want to send them to high school and to college. Environmentalists worry about clean water and clean air for ourselves, but mostly for our children. We still want them to see the mountains and the canyons in their lifetime. Well, I'm scared stiff for our children. Acid rain, toxic waste, PCBs. Do we understand these hazards to our health? Many of us do, because our lives and our families' lives have been deeply affected. The fact is that all of us are at risk. Our awareness of chemical threats on the job and in our communities is a critical step toward changing toxic earth. But what's our government doing to protect us at home and at work? What's our government doing to protect our children? Workers and environmentalists realize that they share a common concern. The same toxic chemicals that damage workers' health also seep into our water, pollute our air, and endanger the health of millions of Americans in communities all around the country. That's why labor unions and environmental groups have joined together to work in organizations like the OSHA Environmental Network. We started with clean air, and we started with occupational safety and health. And so already in three and a half years, we've gotten beyond the experimental stage, and we've all, I think, been impressed with our own knowledge that there are, in fact, many more issues than unite us, than divide us. In the 40s and 50s, there was little awareness of the toxic effects of chemicals, even among scientists, and what was known was usually kept from the public. Workers breathed toxic fumes and routinely handled dangerous chemicals. Today, there are more than 100,000 chemicals in use. New substances are introduced daily. Not all are poisonous, but government research has identified 45,000 with toxic effects. Of those, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, regulates 450 and applies hazard labels to only 21. An estimated 20 million workers will be exposed to potentially dangerous chemicals on the job. George Zerwis was one of them. He worked in an industrial laboratory in Iowa City in 1965. He used benzene to analyze soil samples. You could smell the benzene all through the lab. Uh, it was even to the point where yeah, it could be smelled in the offices, uh, uh, in our offices of, on the next floor mm -hmm. above. Benzene, a common solvent, has been in use since World War II. In the late 70s, it was officially identified as a potential cause of cancer and regulated under OSHA emergency standards. But it was too late for George. He contracted leukemia. It has been known, it's been reported in the literature uh, before that time, all the way back to 1928, that benzene um, was associated with leukemia and that um, I think the, the manufacturers of benzene knew it at the time, but um, was not generally known by the public or people such as George and myself. I don't want what's happened to me to happen to someone else. Uh, I think uh, being aware of the hazards and being protected from them as best possible uh, is is something that should be taken care of uh, so that you don't cut off a man's life at 33. George died a year later, and in spite of strong evidence, an industry lawsuit resulted in OSHA's emergency standards being struck down. According to U.S. government figures, more than 100,000 Americans die annually from diseases caused by occupational exposures, and another one million are disabled. 
but our outdated workman's compensation system recognizes and compensates fewer than 10% of these victims. Among many industrial workers, such as coal miners, textile workers, foundry workers, and others, one out of four develop cancer related to agents in the workplace. OSHA was signed into law in 1970 and is administered by the Department of Labor. OSHA's inspections forced companies to invest in new, safer manufacturing practices, free from hazards to workers. Stiff fines were imposed on companies not in compliance with OSHA standards. Among OSHA's beneficiaries were the textile workers, routinely exposed to cotton dust, causing brown lung disease. OSHA's cotton dust standard offers some protection for workers, but without such regulations, one in seven textile workers is likely to contract bisonosis. Things are different now. Big business seems to be winning the battle for workers' safety. The former head of OSHA under the Reagan administration, Thorne Ochter, is a businessman whose family construction firm earned 49 OSHA citations and $1,400 in fines over the past 10 years. He made it clear that he would sharply curtail OSHA's regulations. That direction was to reflect the basic thrust of this administration to increase the level of risk that the society and its members are expected to tolerate in the name of getting government off our backs. At the Labor Department, OSHA has been systematically immobilized in its enforcement, and many of its previous health standards have been formally challenged. By whom? By the government administrators of those standards, by OSHA itself. Since 1980, because of budget cuts, OSHA closed one-third of its field offices and dropped 30% of its staff. Shop floor inspections have dropped 58%. Penalties have dropped 80%. And perhaps worst of all, no new standards regulating thousands of manufactured chemicals have been put into effect. More than 13 million Americans were exposed to asbestos in the last 40 years. There was no public awareness because the information was suppressed. Lung cancer caused from this mineral takes years to develop. As many as 200,000 people may die from asbestos-associated cancers in the next 20 years. Workers who came home with asbestos particles on their clothes may have contaminated family members. In one study, one out of three family members showed signs of lung abnormalities. <laughs> Workers brought home other substances as well. The case of the agricultural chemical arosolin is, unfortunately, not atypical. I came in contact with arosolin numerous ways. It was an open system for handling. My uniform came home to be washed. There's a chance my wife could have been exposed, you know, through my uniform. During the one and a half years of production of arosolin at their plant in Rensselaer, New York, there were no known normal pregnancies and several cases of heart defects. A company spokesman for the holder of the trademark on the herbicide insists there is no pattern of birth defects in plants that manufacture orizolin. It simply is a coincidence of circumstance, their man said. You know, if, they, if it is a game of multiple coincidences, it, somebody was playing with loaded dice. You know, these kids didn't have a chance. They did a open heart surgery when he was three weeks old. You know, this child has gone through so much surgery and poking and that you or I will never see in our lifetime. And he is only four years old. He died in 1984. OSHA has yet to issue a standard for Rosalyn. It's now being produced in Muskegon, Michigan. Strong limits are critical to prevent exposure to toxic substances in the workplace and in our communities. And we have the right to know if we are in any possible danger from hazardous substances. Some 20 states have passed worker right to know laws, and a few states have community right to know laws. While every state should provide information to communities and workers about toxic exposures, the right to know laws have run into trouble, particularly from chemical companies. The chemical companies don't want to reveal the ingredients of their toxic products because they say it would be giving away trade secrets. New regulations from the Reagan administration now allow chemical companies to decide what you should know, if anything, about your exposure to toxic substances. It's interesting to me that we have under the Food and Drug Administration regulations over things like cosmetics and certain food products and additives where before that product can be put on the market the manufacturer must prove that it's safe 
Now, we all have a choice in those things, whether we use those cosmetics or eat those foods or drink those beverages or whatever. We have a choice. We don't have much choice in the workplace. We don't have much choice in the water we drink. We certainly don't have any choice in the air we breathe. The Clean Air Act required the EPA to regulate air pollution from automobiles, trucks, buses, and 20,000 factories and power plants. Industry resistance to the Clean Air Act has grown since the 70s. There has been widespread non-compliance to the standards. The Clean Water Act of 1972 was enacted to restore the nation's rivers and lakes. Industry discharges over 400 million tons of toxic chemicals into our water annually. Under Ann Gorsuch Burford, the Reagan administration sought to roll back water quality standards, making it easier for industry to pollute. The Environmental Protection Agency was established to protect us and our environment. Has it? Acid rain is the byproduct of emissions from fuel-burning plants and factories. The winds carry the pollutants and combine with precipitation to form acids. Acid rain destroys our forests, our rivers and lakes. An acidified lake looks clear and blue, but in reality it is a watery desert where no living thing can survive. The technology exists to cut emissions, and when the EPA came up with a plan, it was a weak one. Reagan rejected it. While we wait for another plan, acid rain still falls. Now is the time to put an end to the deadly precipitation that is killing our fish, forests, and streams, and draining the public coffers of at least $5 billion each year. Elizabeth, New Jersey, 1980. 30,000 barrels of toxic waste explode, injuring more than 100 people. This could happen at any one of the estimated 30,000 hazardous waste sites across the country. And the problem is growing. 275 million tons of new hazardous wastes are generated from manufacturing every year. That's more than one ton for every person in the United States. The EPA regulates hazardous waste, but only 1% of active sites have received thorough inspections. No new substance has been added to the hazardous waste list in four years. And only 50 million of the 275 million tons of waste are regulated. In Old Forge, Pennsylvania, transformers stored by a local electric company leaked PCBs, or polychlorinated bipanels, a known cancer-causing agent. Wind blew the dust laden with PCBs to a surrounding neighborhood. A state health survey revealed that many residents have PCB levels higher than normal. You can't fish right where the, the site's at, because the land, the land's contaminating stuff. And you walk down there with your shoes, and it gets on your shoes, and you walk back up to your house, and you track it in your house, and it's there. And it's, it doesn't go away. The government is removing the transformers after intense public outcry. But more than two years passed before any action was taken. The soil is still contaminated. $1.6 billion was allocated under Superfund to clean up abandoned toxic dump sites. In 1982, Superfund came under fire because of alleged mismanagement of funds. 20 EPA officials resigned or were fired, including Ann Gorsuch Burford and Rita Lavelle went to jail for lying to congressional committees. Only seven of the 546 priority sites have been cleaned up with Superfund money. At the current rate, it will take the EPA 50 years to clean up currently abandoned hazardous waste sites. Seepage of hazardous waste from the workplace to the community is another problem, one that has surfaced in Silicon Valley, California. The tank was put in the ground in 1976. Maybe our water was contaminated shortly after that. We don't know. The leak came from a Fairchild Industries underground storage tank housing solvents to clean silicon printing disks in the high-tech industry. 
the fiberglass tanks leaked the chemicals downstream to public wells. Well, they found out about it in November of 1981 or December of 1981. My daughter was born in 1981 with uh, multiple congenital heart defects. Lots of miscarriages on our street. We have a, a street that's one block long and we had eight miscarriages on the street in a period of three years. How are you doing? It's very important for people to take an active role when they visit their own physicians with a problem in terms of identifying exposures to toxic substances. Many physicians won't ask the questions that they need to to get at this information and without that information physician can't establish these kinds of links. That's why we need right to know laws but it is essential to have clean and safe equipment. In Santa Clara, the fire department now regulates storage and disposal of toxic solvents. The list of ingredients is confidential information, not available to the public. I think if we knew the amount of chemicals Fairchild had years ago, we would have, would have been a lot more suspicious of them and a lot more protective of our health. Um, the things we were smelling over there coming out of the plant, I think we now know are harmful to us and we would have been a lot more angry, I think, the first time we smelled it. Today's environment is the one we will earn and choose by organizing and working on the issues of occupational and environmental health, by demanding right to know laws, controls on acid rain, strict regulations and enforcement of standards. The alternative is leaving life and death decisions in the hands of polluting corporations relying on lax and inadequate government supervision. Our greatest strength is in working together. We have a challenge as a network and a coalition between environmentalists and labor. We have a challenge to clean up, but in some way to see that that cleanup simply doesn't transfer the pollution someplace else, and to see that in some way people can stay employed at things they want to be employed at and making the sort of wages that they want to make. Knowledge is power. Our protection depends on us being informed and mobilizing as citizens, locally and nationally. A healthy world is our right, a right guaranteed by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and by the Environmental Protection Agency. Those who would sacrifice our health and our children's futures must understand that. There's a coalition out there, a coalition that you don't know about. The environmentalists and labor are together on this issue, and if you attack those two agencies, you attack them, and that's a pretty formidable army for you to be attacking. Good evening. Welcome to our um, 13th year SciArc Design Forum. We started Design Forum uh, public lectures for our students and the community. Uh, our second semester, the idea was to create a platform from which all ideas and points of view could be presented. And I think that's pretty much happened over the years. We've had people from uh, all around the country uh, from other countries, Europe, Mexico, and I think it's proved to be a, a valuable vehicle for getting ideas across and sharing uh, work, architecture. This year we have a, kind of a two-level program. We, we're starting out with uh, two special lectures and there will be a third in October. Um, our speaker tonight is Antoine Predock, and uh, next Wednesday, Mario Campi is coming from Lugano. Uh, 
Compi's work with that of Bota has served to uh, focus the spotlight on the Ticino architecture of Switzerland. And that is where SciArc's uh, school is located. And Mario Compi has been closely associated with that school and will be teaching uh, this coming year. Uh, then we start a kind of a thematic series, Architecture of the Third World. And we have uh, an architect coming from Guatemala, Efrain Recinos, uh, Jerry Lax, who is a solar engineer designer, uh, who was asked to go to Cuba to uh, consult on housing there, will be coming uh, and sharing his experiences and some of the work that's going on down there. Uh, following that uh, will be uh, Sam Hurst, uh, a Los Angeles architect and a professor at USC, and Rick Davidson, an architect uh, in Venice here, who were part of a group of architects and planners who went down to Nicaragua, and they will be uh, sharing their images and their impressions of architecture and urban planning uh, there. Uh, the final uh, speaker in, in that series will be Catherine Blair, uh, who, was an, who was architecturally trained at Yale and who uh, became very interested in the architecture of Nepal and subsequently uh, went there, spent uh, a great deal of time researching the housing, traditional and uh, contemporary, and she will be speaking, uh, the last speaker in that series. And then the third, uh, what I'm calling special lecture, will be uh, Douglas Kelbaugh from Princeton who has done some very interesting work uh, involved with uh, solar technologies. So it's, um, I think it will be an interesting uh, semester of, of lectures running through the next uh, oh, uh, month and a half. We'll be ending in November. Tonight's speaker, uh, Antoine Predoc, uh, attended the University of New Mexico, then did his graduate work at Columbia where he received a fellowship to study for a year in Spain. Adding to that honor, recently, he has been awarded the Prix de Rome, where he will be a fellow at the American Academy beginning uh, next March of 85. He has taught at the University of Maryland, and currently he's teaching here at SciArc. He's lectured uh, widely, uh, including uh, lectures at Columbia, Harvard, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, where his work was included in an exhibit on earth architecture, and uh, also at the Technology University of Tokyo. He has been in private practice since 1967, heading an office of a five, uh, which he characterized as a small but busy office, which has been recognized with local, regional, national, AIA, and PA design awards, and has been published in the major national and international journals. Since he is commuting between Albuquerque and SciArc these days, uh, we invited him to share his work with us tonight because he's here on Monday, so that's why we're having a Monday lecture. Most all of the other lectures will be Wednesday nights, which is our regular design forum night. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you tonight Antoine Predock. Thanks, Shelley. It's strange to see these landscape slides. We were talking about Blade Runner LA in studio today. And I got stuck um, at 6 o'clock going downtown on the Santa Monica Freeway. Got a taste of that. I still love freeways despite that experience. And I, and I learned uh, how to watch my breathing and to get an inner focus going under stress, freeway stress. Um, the big landscapes of the American Southwest inform my work. And they range from um, the one on the left, which is the Hamas, Hamas Range near Abiquiu, New Mexico. It's where George O'Keefe lives and works. You may re recognize Pedernal Peak on the right. Um, several of her paintings have focused on that, the magic of that peak. The, um, the southwest is 
full of magic. The um, high plateau of Taos, to me, is a power center that uh, is quite palpable. The work I've done there is in response to that place in a way that um, I hope channels that power. On the right is a project that it's in the Sor high Sonoran Desert near Phoenix. That's the, uh, I think architecture has nine lives, and that's, that's one of them, and that's the Condominia Galactica permutation of a project that's on the other end is a very straight project. I also think a PA design award can be a kiss of death. So far, this project hasn't, hasn't gotten built. The power of the Southwest landscapes is manifest in various ways. The, on the left is the high plateau near Taos, the great uh, slash of the Rio Grande Valley, cutting through volcanic layers, the wrinkled escarpments on the right near Española, and the high, high ranges of the uh, Sangre de Cristo mountains on the right. The work um, also includes high alpine settings, like the, um, the Wheeler Ridge at 13,000 feet on the left in northern New Mexico as a vantage point, which I'll use later for viewing projects in a small valley near there. The High Sonoran Desert on the right, the site of the project on the, on the previous slide on the right, um, a cowboy movie landscape of, of central Arizona, saguaro cacti, creepy crawlies of all varieties. To um, gain empathy with the site, and I think this is uh, probably routine with most architects, but I, I do go out on the site and have um, kind of encampments. This one was in a mot motor home, wasn't exactly roughing it, but I had my studio under this rock. Um, on the right, and that's looking out the aperture of the, this rock to the site I was working on. Early conceptual sketches were done from that vantage point. My staff and I spent a few days there, different seasons, to get the uh, impressions of the, of the land and the uh, seasonal shifts, wind directions, sun, so forth. From that uh, vantage point, it was easy to look down on the, uh, the site and identify special places on the site. That these special places comprise a desert ritual of their own, ritual of passage, as embodied in passage rock on the left, a monolithic sort of passage. And on the right, paired saguaro that remind me of Shinto Tori minus the crossbar, but that, that, that sense of gateway of threshold. And on this site, there were, there were an accumulation of um, magic locations like these that I used to inform the, uh, the layout of the project. Besides the rituals of sight, the magic of sight, site also, this site also addresses um, invented, invented rituals, rituals that say come from Hollywood movies, like blazing sunsets, cookouts, night sky, lightning storms. And this assemblage of images, mainly postcards, be became an early point of departure for thinking about color. I like Rothko edges, and the colors of the, the project will, will ho hopefully be soft and merge with one another in a similar fashion. The, um, the obvious historic references to, um, that you can't escape in the Southwest, to the Anasazi, to the aggregations of Pueblo buildings in the Rio Grande Valley, northern Arizona. The um, 
the contrived rituals, the Hollywood movie cowboy landscape rituals of a project are ones that parallel the natural formations and give and inspire certain responses in interior courts, plazas, um, processional sequences through the, through the project that I'm leading up to. Ed Ruscha on the right. This is an autobiographical talk, I guess. It's uh, divided into some obvious divisions. The first one will be talking about um, rituals of sight, rituals of place, in this case the Arizona Project, ending up with um, <clears throat> the uh, transitioning into the New Mexico High Plateau and um, projects that relate to that landscape and a couple of current houses. Then the High Alpine Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Then the uh, Rio Grande Valley. And then in and then the American uh, Wild West uh, strip architecture. So in that it's autobiographical, in a way, that thread paralleling the projects, I'll just show glimpses of, of um, influences that probably crop up in unseen ways in the work. The travel has always been important, and these are recent sketches from a trip to northern Italy. They have relationships to the project I'm describing that will be obvious. Recent um, revisit to the Acropolis and a watercolor on the right done as a student in Madrid, the Ayuntamiento. Part of the work is, um, has been involved in theater, design of, env of environments for dance and, and teaching joint workshops for dancers and architects at uh, UNM in Albuquerque. Architecture is about procession and choreography, so a dose of this doesn't hurt anyone. The familiar southwest landscapes, the, um, you know, the adobe village, the ruins of uh, Quaray Mission on the right, the realities of the desert. A uh, friend of mine on the right, we set forth across the uh, desert north of Phoenix. And the science fiction presence of the desert. One can easily imagine that cattle mutilation happening in northern New Mexico in landscapes such as these. In first looking at the Arizona project, from under the rock, I identified uh, on the left special moments on the site having to do with the presence of particular objects, a certain rock tree composition, triple saguaros, as you see on the lower right, um, natural washes, sunrise, sunset points, and thought about the kind of rituals that might have occurred over time. Um, fires at night overlooking the, the Great Valley that is now Phoenix and Scottsdale. This is a site that's far from Phoenix and Scottsdale against Pinnacle Peak. Looks out across the it's kind of black void at night before you hit Scottsdale and Phoenix lights. <clears throat> Water in the desert, active and both active and passive versions of it. Barbecue, cookout, Cool passage, lacy shade, lacy shade inspired by the Palo Verde trees and the Ocotillo branches. Sunset rock on the right, um, a great mass of boulders, decomposed granite boulders, fallen away from a ridge that backs up the project. And on the right, um, I thought a lot of um, what Wright said about that part of the uh, Sonoran Desert on arrival to build Ocotillo in the 30s before Taliesin, that the desert was a broken line. And the, uh, the ridges around the project I'm working on attest to that, as does the desert floor, which is a broken line of Ocotillo. Um, 
Palo Verde and, and Ironwood. The great rock formations of the site and drawings I did on, on site on the right, one reminds me of Mont Saint Michel almost on the right, that kind of citadel. Then as the, uh, the work progressed on site, process drawings such as the one on the left evolved, looking at uh, In particular, unit orientations. These are 30, 30 units, 30 townhouse units. Testing orientation on the site. This is a four by eight drawing nailed up on a, on a four by eight sheet of plywood and taken around from site to site on the, within the project to check out views, wind directions for air, air, uh, air movement corridors, and to entrap the ritual elements. Along with that, um, early clay model studies. I was doing. Uh, I was do working in clay more than I was two-dimensionally. On the right is the is a project of 60 units. I keep. I refer to a 30-unit phase, which is the right half of it separated by the wash. On approaching the project, the uh, the notion of village gate of major gateway um, was a compelling one because it set up a kind of blank wall entry condition from which the experiences of landscape and trap landscape and contrived passage link and linked courts could develop. I've always loved the aqueduct at Segovia drawing I did on the left four or five years ago, how it is a veil for Segovia, for new, new Segovia. Um, just the implication of architecture behind it. Toledo and Chino in the Loa Valley. Fortress architecture, architecture that's defensive against elements. has always fascinated me against elements that are environmental and elements of, of uh, the enemy may contrive. The way Toledo spills down to the Tejo. Platform architecture, Monte Alban near Oaxaca. One of the pyramidal temples atop that great Acropolis made me think of um, the use of the pyramid in this project. The bent pyramid of Dashur for a visit to Egypt on the left. On the right, you see a pyramid in the, uh, the last courtyard toward you. It's since been relocated to phase one, but that pyramid had to do with the contrived ritual, the, um, the worship of sun, the worship of the night sky. I'm imagining um, high rollers from, from Ohio coming out here to the Sun Belt and thinking about what their TV expect expectations might be, what their movie expectations might be. So I thought a pyramid of the sun was a good move. So it's a step pyramid, hollow underneath with apertures to view the night sky and solstice alignment so there can be points chiseled below in the concrete that line up with solstice angles. On top are four Ticate beer cans set in recesses with refrigeration coils, which must be um, ritually sacrificed and not drunk, poured over the pyramid so it accretes a film of, of um, Ticate over time. After the fact, I started thinking about a geological relationship to the project. And you could go either way on the left slide. You could think of it as, you know, being the right slide and then backing up to upper left or going either way. The idea of expo exposed strata and the harder uh, strata like a volcanic plug remaining as projections. Projections, uh, shown in that geologic drawing, became these triangular elements that I think of as barbs, like cactus barbs, that spike out of the project, out of the long low. Um, I think of this as a low rider architecture. There are, there are a lot of low rider cars in New Mexico, and I, there's a long low landscape, a horizontality about New Mexico. And I thought, thought of, I thought of architecture as a 
you know, can be an extension of that. It's also, uh, I also think of a taco a lot, in, in that this, this project is a shell that's um, desert floor related. The olive beige is the gray greens of the desert floor. And out of that spikes, these uh, barbs that are mauves, burn oranges, purples, like the uh, ridges that exist to the top of the slide to the north, north of the uh, project site. So those, uh, are, those triangles are abstractions of those ridge forms. And they uh, form paired links between courts. I think of this as an architecture of uh, fat walls, a house in the desert where these are the rooms that are open to the sky. So the units themselves, this is one unit. There are 29 different plans. One unit uh, is a wall thickness, generates a wall thickness, and sets this six-room house in the desert, the big-scale six-room house. Aside from the natural features that inform, and you can see those in the slide on the right, sunset rock at the corresponding position on the model. Besides those, there's a water score, um, water, hopefully like music, leading from a, a very geometric source at the top to a, isn't drawn here, but a, a very uh, naturalistic pool nestled in the rocks, pumped back up the hill, um, appearing, reappearing, going away, coming back as in different guises, from spray to sheet, a minimalist sheet of water in this cloistered court, two different kinds of spray, to the dashed lines of uh, water implied below grade, girling along the, through gap bricks. Each one of those effects adding evaporative cooling to quartz as well as giving a different uh, cueing to those quartz. The energy moves are um, fairly standard. I like the idea of architecture backing into uh, the land in, in the Sonoran Desert. It feels cool when you do that, so the bedrooms are oriented back that way with code height windows occurring on the flanking walls, um, direct gain to, to uh, tile and brick floors, cool colors within, inductive cooling patterns up and out the barbed projections, a system of layered jackets that are grilled, uh, they're kind of like portals in New Mexico, we call them, project out from them, that extend the window from the, the thick wall of the building out to a, a thinner jacket that jackets the buildings on problem, problem orientations. Air movement um, through the courts, tight cellular planning like North Africa to Maximize shading of structure to structure. Drawing of Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Benito on the left, on the right, uh, that I did a few years ago of showing the uh, sense of embedment in, in, in the ground, the kivas, which is an inspiring uh, image that I've always liked. Queen Hatshepsut's funerary temple, even though it wasn't occupied by the living, it still is a great image for um, Southwest landscape architecture backing into a cliffside the way this frog or toad knows how to do too. The cool dark passages of uh, Egyptian architecture. Hypostyle Hall at Karnak and the pile of ruin at Karnak on the right. The, the nocturnal patterns of the desert, looking out across the desert during lightning storms, seeing the sea of lights in Phoenix on the air. This is an airbrush drawing, drawing on the right done by Jeff Beebe on my staff. Um, the model showing the sequence of, of um, progression of courts and linked passages. The deep dark shade of Egyptian architecture reminded me to be sure and do that, how that, that kind of emanation of coolness that you get from heavy stone around you. So every cord is linked with a, with a long, dark passage. Water 
running through it below in, in the gapped bricks, gurgling along. I always like the image of uh, coming upon a fire in the distance at night, in the summer, say, or the spring, in the high country of New Mexico or Arizona, or a window of a cabin in the winter throwing a, a ray of light across the, uh, the, the snow. So this project has um, rooftop fires on approaching it across the black void from Phoenix. You see fires twinkling on the uh, flickering on the, the rooftops. On terraces. Some vignette drawings I did of passages through the, uh, the project. Lower right you can see one of the slots. It's mostly a, an architecture that provides points of reference, datums, for the desert. So on the upper left, that's a very characteristic experience, just looking out across a wall to unscathed Sonoran Desert. The Quanat lines of ancient, ancient Persia on the right, that notion of water heard and sensed but not seen, an efficient way of moving water in the desert, made me think of those uh, gapped bricks, the water gurgling below. This vortex, the water is dash, dash, dashing along, vanishes, reappears in the passageway and goes away. You hear it and it leads you on down. That's the relocated pyramid of the sun and the moon. The science fiction presence of the desert, straight project on the left for white belt, white shoe golfers. Project on the right for galactic derelicts. On the left of the right slide is a cosmic boneyard residue from great confrontations since this was a kryptonite source that was in high demand. It's like road warrior, post-nuclear ro road warrior. Con the uh, galactic uh, derelicts tried to get that kryptonite and in doing so, ravage the area around it and you see residue of their there's a Klingon transport there on the left in that pile but the people that lived there were good people and they prevailed the autonomy of architecture in the Aldo Rossi sense of architecture that can fit <coughs> various cultural overlays archetypal enough to prevail in the desert that's what I hope this would be Our spiritual talisman, the jackalope, on the left slide. Since uh, P.A. Ward might have been meant the kiss of death on this, I think of this as architectural reincarnation. The soul of Desert Highlands, the 30-unit project, left its body and entered this house. Um, you get pretty metaphysical hanging around the desert long enough, but I assure you I don't eat any of the plants there. I don't need them. This project is about procession from sunrise to sunset, the sunrise pavilion temple on the right, the sunset tower on the left, and in between a pyramid that is uh, in relation to the landscape beyond. It's a step pyramid for seating for looking down into a, a central courtyard with a pool. You can see on the right slide um, progression of water coming from the upper right through to the pool. It's very, very geometric and linear. And on the, on the uh, bottom is another a naturalistic quasi arroyo um, water passage coming to join the, um, the central pool. So water to water. And on the way, an interior canyon gallery flanked by kitchen, dining, breakfast nook, and the pyramid, which is a study. I want the pyramid to have a dirt floor and a smoke hole on the top so it looks like a volcano.
Now I want to talk about New Mexico, the high, uh, from the high alpine landscapes, at the top of the left slide, in the uh, San Antonio Mountain on the top right, the southern uh, extension of the Sangre de Cristos. That every, every mountain range in New Mexico has a personality. They look different. The colors that I, I used on these drawings are really uh, quite explicit. The, the, the gray greens near Taos on the upper right, this is the, the wonderful uh, blood red of the Sangre de Cristos. The, the brooding blue Hamas range. Mount Taylor as a distant icon to the west. And those same mountains on the right with the Rio Grande Valley slashing through it all. The, uh, the center dots, Albuquerque, and the little dot in the top is, ta no, the big dot down here is Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Taos in the top. My work um, responds to those mountain ranges, orients toward them in particular ways. I, I've been rather uh, obsessive about connecting architecture to landscape, and I'll show in this autobiographical uh, mode, I'll show you early work that, that did that quite overtly. Um, Tim Street Porter showed me these crazy cat cartoons, and I realized that uh, this Harriman who did them must have been visited by UFOs or something in the 20s because he went from urban sites to these surreal um, American Southwest landscape backdrops. And architecture, uh, you can always see you know, architecture in clouds or landscapes, rock formations if you try hard enough. In the American Southwest, it's, it's really kind of automatic. There are those places that George O'Keefe paints that look like you know, heightened, her heightened version of um, sculptural landscape form are really quite literally portrayed. So in New Mexico especially, there's uh, an architecture that uh, a landscape that becomes an, uh, a metaphor for architecture. A painting I did on the right a long time ago along that line of uh, abstraction of landscape. Richard Diebenkorn was teaching at University of New Mexico when I did that. I, was, I think I was influenced by him. The landscape elements look like big architecture in Cabezon Peak on the right. The uh, Acropolis of, Ta of uh, Acoma, Sky City, um, west of Albuquerque on the left. And a watercolor I did of um, Monasterio de Guisantes or Guisada, something like that, near Salamanca, central Spain, in the 60s. And a recent, recent visit to um, Les Beaux de Provence near Arles on the right, that, that great um, eminence of rock that becomes a monastery and a village, met metamorphoses into uh, from rock to monastery. So I like those overt um, landscape references in architecture. And they happen in a, in a really big, big way in the Southwest automatically. I even, when I like, like the uh, Mission Church at Quaray on the right, and I noticed when I went to the Acropolis uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I was really drawing it as landscape. I wasn't drawing it as a building anymore. I think in its condition, present condition, it really is returning to landscape and is sort of completes the circle of stone to stone. My first project in 1966-67 um, was called La Luz. It was a raid on the land on a 500-acre site, 100 homes, to suggest, this is sort of looking back at it, when I, a lot of these things I think of later. I'm not, I don't think I was telling the client it was supposed to look like an escarpment when I did it. I think they were just telling them they were regular old townhouses. But they, the, the aggregation of buildings on that higher uh, stretch of the site suggests a, uh, a landform in the continuity of color and the, uh, the walled contained perimeter. It's an architecture that reverses from on approach. It's a big blank wall. It's adobe turned toward the, the road in the harsh elements. The, tough spring winds that are laden with dust and the uh, 
the low sun angles. The reverse side is, um, has the duality of total openness and, and aims toward views over the city at night and, and toward a great mountain range across the Rio Grande Valley. There's also the promise of an inner oasis that is revealed at a distance where you see trees peeking above the buildings linked by passages such as these, one court to another, and selective kind of view release toward big landscape as in the right across the autumn colors of Rio Grande Valley toward the Sandia Mountains. Setting an edge that's very definite between the buildings and the existing mesa, which is retained as an open space system by covenant in the project on the left slide. Water-related courtyards interconnect in this project as well as the Arizona one. Architecture of big blank walls. Um, New Mexico, the tripartite scheme of base, piano no nobile, and um, top dissolve into an architecture, an unapologetic architecture of just big walls with the earth as the base, the sky as the top, and the wall mediating between the two. I haven't done many cornices on these buildings. So this is 67 through about 72. appropriate Hollywood ending to this project on the right. The uh, linked courtyards have view aspects such as the one on the left of looking out across buildings which terrace down to the river valley and uh, across toward mountain views such as these. In the mid-70s, several houses, this is one uh, situated in the foothills of the Sandia Mountains near Albuquerque. kind of abstraction of the cliff face, color related to the um, decomposed granite boulders and gravel. Theatrical centerpiece of fireplace with step seating wrapping around it for gatherings. House near Santa Fe from about 1979 or 80. Layered approach through Pinon Juniper on the right through a um, succession of walls that lead into, uh, through an entry court to surrounding terraces. The high country around Taos, on the left is the gorge of the Rio Grande. And on the right, a Campo Santo, a very familiar image, the high country north of Truchas. The ubiquitous junk car in the New Mexico landscape and the Penitente Cross. The church at Las Trampas and the sketch on the left. And I really like the image on the right. It's a really tricultural event. These kids are getting air off of the uh, buttresses of Francis de Taos Church, that sacrosanct mission church that everyone's painted and photographed from Paul Rand on down the line. It's a little encouragement for me, I must admit. There's a comfortable irreverence towards some of those buildings in New Mexico. Tennis Ranch of Taos is in that high, high plateau setting a necklace of buildings that um, surrounds tennis courts, blocking prevailing winds, which come from down here. <clears throat> Again, entrapping courts with selective view release out toward the landscape um, around the project.
This is a uh, recent project in the same area, a collection of, of um, rooms that have some relationship to um, accreted Spanish villages in the area of Tezuque, New Mexico, north of Santa Fe. It's uh, m uh, vernacular metal roofing, corrugated metal roofing, stucco colors that um, are what I've told the client were frozen sunset colors. Um, the first diagram on the right, getting up the hill, images of Tuscany, whatever that has to do with it, it's all in the soup. The sketch on the right is the uh, suggestion of how the colors might vary from piece to piece. It's um, on the site, I established a, uh, an axis, a, a set of shifting axes for the house by, by running up the site, starting down about where the garage is on the lower section, and running a, uh, a line that felt good up the hillside. And I came back and staked my footprints. That accounts for the twisting, turning alignments. They also have to do with particular views. The, um, the bedroom tower looks toward the Los Alamos lights at night. It's in the center of the building. And the, the, uh, the upper shed-like living room breaks over the, this ridge to great views of the Tezuke Valley. It's uh, processionally ceremonially arrayed on the hillside that my clients are musicians and they would have a performance at night. Visitors would come up, climb up here to an entry court, pass through a gallery, enter a uh, quasi uh, proscenium in reverse, become an actor as they emerge into the living room where there might be a performance, performance going on where they then would become the audience. Another project that's currently under construction. Both of these houses are under construction now. This one tries to look like a mountain in a way. It's a big, long shed, two-way shed, relating to uh, San Antonio Mountain, symbolically in the distance. The right slide is just off the slide to the right. It's a big, round, rounded mountain. And then it's, uh, it's the mountain then with a village jammed up against either side of it. These are bedrooms and ancillary spaces, guest house. They're stair-stepped up the, uh, the flanks of the mountain. It's nothing like foam core and blue sky. I do take advantage of the New Mexico mountains and um, and luck, I'm lucky enough to get work in the high alpine settings. This is, these, are in, uh, these shots are in Taos Ski Valley where my friends and I do a lot of ski mountaineering, which the payoff being un, unbroken powder fields like on the left as opposed to skiing trails. This has led to work in Taos Ski Valley. This is a little on-slope restaurant full of passive solar measures, uh, splayed walls, 55-gallon drum tables inside with um, used as, as serving tables filled with water, capped, and um, thermal storage in the heavy concrete walls and a central massive fireplace conducting into the concrete. The story has a sad ending, although I think um, any good piece of architecture should make a great ruin. It burned down 3 a.m. one snowy night That's what molten steel roofing does. I like the idea of entropic architecture. The, um, in our class, we're talking about LA as a, in one sense, as a system winding down. And we're going to look at Blade Runner next, next Monday as a collection of images. I think that has a Blade Runner-ish quality. Another project in the Ski Valley, um, 18 housing units, 
precast concrete so that um, we could build through a winter season. Just have to, we just had to weld and grout joints so we could um, keep construction moving through inclement weather. Exploded axon shows the um, panelization. It's a, a green tinted concrete shell with inserts of wood, glue lamb beams used as fascias, and um, redwood railings. Each house is approached as though it were a separate cabin under a, a great sheltering carport on the right with a kind of glued on wood facade to escape the uh, stigma of all concrete construction. This project has a, a kind of landscape sense in that its slope, roof slope matches surrounding ridges, aligns with some of the mountain slopes. And to check out that, to see if that metaphor of architecture and landscape was really true, I decided to go for it and see if the building skied well. I have to tell you, it skis very well. The Rio Grande Valley, Albuquerque is uh, in, in 1884 on the left. The uh, railroad meets the Hispanic culture. Railroads here, Old Town, the random ranchos and um, rural development of Old Town and then the Creeping toward it, Midwest USA, the railroad brought, brought out images of Kansas City, Chicago, and um, so you find prairie houses. You even find um, my house is a, I just read that book, Architecture of LA, and it's, it's a craftsman bungalow. So you had bungaloid from the west, and uh, French motherhood apple pie, and front porch stoop swings and coming from the east, it's the Midwest all converging in the neighborhood where I live, which is right about here. And in that valley context, there's another architecture that happens. It's one related to, uh, to Old Town Albuquerque. In this case, it's a, a city museum, the Albuquerque Museum that I did about six years ago, 65,000 square foot, long, low building, another kind of low rider building, trying not to compete with um, the low scale of Old Town, old Spanish Old Town. Big blank walls, the walls of the building acting as a projection screen at sunset for the silhouette of Old Town in the slide on the left. Very neutral building forming a backdrop for the funky passages on the left of Old Town shops, galleries, etc. And within its layout um, and trapping spaces, courtyard spaces, sheltered as the one on the right. An installation by Ken Price, an LA artist, moved to Taos on the right. And in that valley setting, the Rio Grande Valley, um, I got a, a building to do. It's a, what started as a migratory wildfowl refuge, a master plan for about 160 acres on the right agricultural cultural crop lands that had been there since day one. Um, irrigation systems with roots in Andalusia, North Africa. They're called acequias, which is a, an Arab word for, uh, for drainage canal. Came, was integrated into the Spanish. Um, it's for migratory birds, uh, sandhill cranes, snow geese, Canada geese, and every other, every kind of duck you can think of, and smaller birds and all other denizens of wetlands that you can imagine. So we had to establish in an area that was formerly a marshland and reestablish that marsh by digging into the water table and planting marsh crops that become forage for the birds, as well as establishing a share crop relationship with local farmers to perpetuate that cultural uh, connection to the, the area we call the bosque. Um, to provide crops that the birds liked in the large green areas, especially the, like corn and millet for the Canada geese on a, on a percentage basis where they leave percentage for the birds and cash in on the rest. Siding of the building on the left, 
parking area and then a, a sh shadowy passage through the bosque forest to the building itself. The entry is through a it's through a drainage culvert, corrugated culvert that um, addresses the the alternative image of the Rio Grande Valley that the uh, Corps of Engineers vernacular that persists in on river in river basins. We haven't channelized the Rio Grande yet, like the LA River, but uh, the the Corps would love to do it, and it's ready to strike any time. But we have uh, monkey, wrench, monkey wrench gang types in New Mexico, if you read that book. So the core doesn't stand a chance. Through the culvert to, um, the, so the building's a uh, duck blind it, that relates to the uh, technology of the river bottom. Corps of Engineer head walls, drainage structures, poured concrete culverts. On entering the gallery, you move through a, a layer of of um, plastic uh, water-filled tubes that, depending on who I'm, who I'm talking to, if I were talking to a passive solar group, all those are there for passive. But they're really there because they look good and they're for uh, their passive decoration. <laughs> they, they emanate um, light from an artificial source above and also from through diffraction patterns and diffusion from skylights that seasonally hit the tubes and create a, a kind of aquatic feel in the gallery. You can see them completing the circle of the gallery on the right shot. So they, they bound the, uh, this gallery, which is an interpretive setting for describing the place the building's located in. The pyramid is food chain, a food chain diagram. There's a, there's a geologic display. All these displays are related to um, carefully oriented windows that you see in the right slide in the back that look out toward uh, specific features like one looks at a big cottonwood tree and another looks at a panorama of the bosque, another one looks at the, uh, the mountain range so geology can be interpreted along with, with um, the upfront marshlands and, and that life of those denizens. Water is a great theme in the project. Kids can pump water out of the ground table with that hand pump. I call them view rays that go out from the building. You can see the different view rays. I don't know if you can read the captions, but they, uh, they suggest different themes that are explored in the positioning of the windows. Look out of the building. The views are toward the marsh land on the right and toward the, the forest on the left is a periscope that looks underwater. That will feature a fish on a leash. So we haven't been able to get a fish to hang around there. Looking across, this is the view the visitor wouldn't get, looking back at the, the building, a kind of land submarine surfacing from the pond. And the view on the right from within the library section of the building, looking across the pond toward the mountains. <clears throat> Canada geese, and on the right, a, a lesser sandhill crane that they come down from Idaho and southern Canada down the flyway. They're also foster parents of the uh, endangered whooping cranes. They, you know, they slip eggs into their nests, and the whooping crane grows up thinking it's a sandhill crane. Halloween, four on the left. I thought of camouflaging the building at it's, it's camouflage in a naturalistic sense on the entry side. The duck blind is complete with, with plantings on the, the bermed embankments against the building. I thought of doing a, uh, this, kind of, this camouflage job. That was a few years before everybody started wearing camouflage. And I was afraid that you uh, couldn't see anybody walking by the building because they would just merge with it. In that same valley setting, this is a project that's under construction. It's, um, it's a house in the uh, Rio Grande Valley. <clears throat> the same uh, 
same relationship to the river as that previous project. It's uh, two axes, one related to the, to the grid of the uh, irrigated fields along the Rio Grande, the other axis splaying toward the, in the right slide, splaying toward the view of the mountains, taking along for, uh, for the ride the, the bedroom wing, which is in the, the two-story section to the top of the left slide. It's a very uh, quiet building, long and low, nestled into the, uh, the valley setting. Crossed pitched roof pavilions, corrugated metal roofs, archetypal forms of the Rio Grande Valley combined with the horizontal architecture, horizontal parapet architecture. <clears throat> you drive up to a big blank wall that's almost the whole width of the, of the lot. <clears throat> drive through that, walk into an inner court, enter into this pavilion, which aims you toward the mountain view via a gazebo at this end. I had to do a gazebo. And this axis is uh, the dining pavilion projecting out views of the mountains. Dining area projecting terrace pavilion, kitchen, guest house, pool, upper level terrace off the be bedroom zone. This is a decomposing trellis. also is about low riders and tacos. Strip architecture. In the early 70s, I was really chicken about the strip. Um, you, well, you know what a strip is, I think. It's something like, ours are something like watered down ones, you know, that you would have maybe out in, on uh, PCH or, or Anaheim Street, Wilmington. They're real flaky strips. They're not nearly as good as, say, Lincoln Boulevard, just south of Ocean Park. So I was, I was, I never had a very clear response to them. So what I did was back off. This is a bank. I always wanted to do a rotated pyramid, and the bank became a vehicle for that. But it was also a, a way of entrapping a contemplative um, environment for, for banking within these walls. You have banking halls, top right of that slide, um, regular banking halls with a foreground courtyard that isolated the inner um, areas of the building from, this, from the street, from wall-to-wall um, -wall suburbia and strip. So it was an area that you came into like a convent or monastery to uh, do your transactions in. This doesn't quite fit, does it? And then you looked back out across the walls from the interior court at the mountains placed on the wall, the view, uh, strategically oriented to set the mountain on the wall. And lately I've, I've uh, loosened up about the strip. This is a project from about uh, three years ago. It's United Blood Services. It's a nonprofit voluntary blood bank located, in, uh, located on a strip in Albuquerque. It explores, uh, it, it, besides being an architectural one-liner, which I, is the aspect that I tended, I wanted to emphasize, it explores rituals of uh, blood donation. I, the, uh, the rituals begin with instant identity from, from a distance, since it's a non-profit non, non voluntary blood bank.
something like watered down ones, you know, that you would have maybe out in on uh, PCH or, or Anaheim Street, Wilmington. They're real flaky strips. They're not nearly as good as, say, Lincoln Boulevard, just south of Ocean Park. So I was, I was, I never had a very clear response to them. So what I did was back off. And this is a bank. I always wanted to do a rotated pyramid, and the bank became a vehicle for that. But it was also a, a way of entrapping a contemplative um, environment for, for banking within these walls. You have banking halls, top right of that slide, um, regular banking halls with a foreground courtyard that isolated the inner um, areas of the building from, this, from the street, from wall-to-wall um, -wall suburban strip. So it was an area that you came into like a convent or monastery to uh, do your transactions in. This doesn't quite fit, does it? And then you looked back out across the walls from the interior court at the mountains placed on the wall, the view, uh, strategically oriented to set the mountain on the wall. And lately I've, I've uh, loosened up about the strip. This is a project from about um, three years ago. It's United Blood Services. It's a nonprofit voluntary blood bank located, in, uh, located on a strip in Albuquerque. It explores, uh, it, it, besides being an architectural one-liner, which I, is the aspect that I tended, I wanted to emphasize, it explores rituals of uh, blood donation. I, the, uh, the rituals begin with instant identity from, from a distance, since it's a non-profit non, voluntary blood bank, and then lead the uh, prospective donor through a... Um, sequence of, of arrival. You see it from the freeway from 10 miles away and then from about a half mile away. And it obviously is a building that's assigned just like the billboards. And you get great Baroque axes in Albuquerque. Looking at the railroad tracks, you get it. And on the right, you see in construction, the entry parking lot is a plaza, a dished plaza like the Piazza del Campo. I always wanted to do a sleazy version of that. And it, with a center uh, cottonwood tree. The green grass of the, um, you see in the right slide, is carefully chosen mixture of bluegrass and K32 fescue to, to vibrate off the wall color. The donors get the impression on the right, welcome with open arms um, to the entry court, parking court, and the staff gets the black top up against the peri perimeter wall. That's because the donors are really special. They, it, it's quite, um, I think it's quite a gesture to donate blood. There's that aspect of ritual. The donors themselves are quite competitive. They're very proud of, of what they do. They, uh, they even compete, try to outdraw each other, so to speak. And they, uh, in doing so, this building evolved that, that was very, um, responsive to their needs so they get their own sp special parking plaza. When Venturi did that, one of his first projects, I think it was a little dental clinic and had a shaped parking area. I really liked that. I thought that it would be great to someday do a really special shaped parking lot. And in another project I'll conclude with later, I'll show you the, another manifestation of that. So when approaching the building, the donor moves through um, a succession of events. You go through um, the court, through a, a skylit atrium, into the drawing room, so-called, and you look out across the uh, an entry, uh, a garden, toward the uh, mountain view. When I did this, I got a call from the mayor's office asking me if that was the prime code. <laughs> That's a donor scoreboard on the right. You can see gallonage. That's gallonage on the top scale, uh, following stick on uh, donors' names that are moved along that scale of, of uh, quantity to the right. They're very proud of what they do. And it, it's a, the color is the color of life. It's about life and, and uh, the act of giving life. 
I never had a, any morbid co connotations of my own about red. Certain people in Albuquerque do, but most of them don't. The, the, the units drawn in the facility have quadrupled since they moved from their old facility to this one, which attests to that fact that it's uh, working okay beyond their expectations, in fact. This is the view from the donor's position out across the garden, which will have purple leaf tr plum trees a little bit higher as they grow uh, taller and screening the street, and setting the mountain view like the bank did, but also opening that parking court more to the street than it did. Uh, in the strip setting, this is a project that's a uh, current one also, hopefully in, under construction soon. It's called Clinico Equipo. It's a, a sports medicine clinic house. It's 4,000 square feet, 2,000 square feet of sports medicine clinic, two of house. The pyramid is the nerve center of the sports medicine clinic. It's a, it bathes the universal gym in golden light. It is a, juxtaposed to a stepped fire pit. And on that terrace, there will be a, um, a water garden. The base is the earth. The top is the sky. It's a kind of mountain. So it's earth air, fire, and water. The axis skews from the podium to aim toward symbolic views of the Sandia Peak ski area since it's a, more, a sports medicine clinic. And I'm going to try to, since I skied my building in Taos, I'm going to try to get my client to ski this whenever there's snow in the next, this coming winter and get a shot of it for his brochure. From an approach, you'll see exercise apparatus on the terrace of the house signaling its uh, presence as a sports medicine clinic and, and an expression of my owners, uh, my clients, Jarrett and Ruth's uh, vigorous lifestyle. It has bicycle imagery in its detailing. They're both distance bicyclists as I am. And uh, so you have, this is a real in, in description, a few of you will understand it, but it's Nuovo record at the base super record in the middle and Grupo Commemorativo on top. That has to do with the refinement of the detailing. A lot of cables and connectors like that. That sort of thing, uh, you know, cable handrails relating to bicycle imagery. I've always liked the temple at Luxor, the way it's a base for a mosque. That, uh, again, that kind of autonomy of architecture, how the, the temple can be really bent out of shape. And you can see the scale of the temple when you see that mosque. And I thought of this building kind of that way, that it's a platform with um, architecture strewn around on top of it. The, um, the house has a, a greenhouse hot tub here, <clears throat> living room here, kitchen here with a roof deck a loft as the slope climbs up for a bedroom, a roof terrace accessed by a hatch, and then balconies aiming toward the mountain view. The clinic is conventionally laid out, uh, orthogonal and very predictable and, and efficient for his operation. I thought I should have waited for that slide. There's the description of the in interior spaces. <coughs> going to have blue metal roof, blue metal roofing and uh, blue stucco from the terrace up, like that. And I want to conclude with this project. It's another strip project, only this is a really special strip in Albuquerque. You all know about this because your ancestors must have traveled it from the Grapes of Wrath on down the line to get here. I don't think any of you probably, probably flew here. You, I'm sure you all migrated out in covered wagons and, and uh, 62 Mercuries. So this is Highway 66 passing through Albuquerque, a poignant vestige of the, um, the originally powerful um, continuity, continuity of um, funk motel architecture and neon. You can see the blood bank there in this left slide. This is as, as the um, city darkens, you get a, a great light show in Albuquerque, much like the LA Basin. 
viewed from Mulholland Drive. All my students told me to go up to Mulholland Drive, and, and I did that. And um, took a friend along with me too. It was really nice. This project is called uh, The Beach. It's on a site formerly occupied by the Beach Motel. Beach Motel was, a, I guess, a late 40s motel that related to uh, an old swimming beach that was scraped out along the Rio Grande. It got a high level of botulism, so people quit, quit swimming in it. But it, the Beach Motel kept its name and its myth so the project that's going to replace it is called The Beach. It's a 74-unit apartment building. And these are, quote, contextual shots, unquote. Low riders, motorcycles, uh, a powerful car culture manifest on, on Old West Central, US 66. US 66 passes by University of New Mexico. Um, it's the, it's the long, it used to be the longest main street in the world. It is about, um, oh, I can't see that out in LA. It's really embarrassing. The, um, anyway, it's, it's a continuous fabric of buildings that range from deco shopping centers to uh, motels of every vintage. Downtown Albuquerque, the railroad, um, the hub where it crosses the railroad. And now it's, a, it's the uh, hot spot for cruising. one of the old um, motel entries on the left. So what I'm doing is called a beach, and it's a 74-unit low rider that spreads out horizontally along 66 and derives its form from, it's a kind of synthesis of the things I've talked about. It's about landscape, culture. Um, this is a wreck of a horse trailer could have occurred along there. There's a, there's a kind of mythic quality about the West still, and you see people with horse trailers in the Southwest, and um, that juxtaposed to low riders is really intriguing. The stepping of the building sets a base middle top condition that relates to the greens and olive beiges of the, the bosque, the river, the forested river's edge. The center colors, um, sunset colors of the mesas and the mountains surrounding Albuquerque, and the top, the blue sky, hopefully at times dissolving into the sky. Those are four penthouse terraces, view, view, um, viewpoints. Also, those four terraces remind me of mountains. They're, these are valleys and therefore mountains with valleys between. I think it's important for architecture to have a story, and that story comes and goes. I can tell this story about mountains and colors, and you know it works as a building or it doesn't. But I think it's interesting that architecture has a story and also has a, an autonomy, a universality, that, so that it persists um, in an archetypal fashion, irrespective of use as in the first project where it became Condominia Galactica, I don't think you can favor any one occupant. I wouldn't tell a client that. It's paying the bills. It's actually true. Site plan shows um, old 66 in the gray, <clears throat> the serpentine entry establishing a, uh, a linear parking pattern that takes care of the, the main parking but then dissolves into fragmented parking courts, parking courts within entrapped areas and ones that are within the, the fabric of the building. You, one, the one thing I like about old 66 motels is that they, the car was always addressed in such a delicate way. It had, uh, unlike say Kmart parking lots which are vacuous, these old, old parking lots of motels were always sensitively scaled. You could barely make the turning radius, but it was it had a you know a nice vehicular scale, and each usually each uh, motel had a carport. So these are carports, 
passages and you can drive through if you have one of the penthouses and have access to a garage back through another parking court. So there are about four layers of parking, of different parking scales. <clears throat> the plans are very conventional, very repetitive. It's broken into four houses. That's sort of a house and that's a house on down the line. Very cheap, repetitive construction. It straddles the cultural fault line, the, the realm of the low rider on one side, and on the other side, the white belts and white shoes of the Albuquerque Country Club. So on the Country Club side, it has some red tile tokenism and white walls that look sort of uh, mission architecture because the Country Club is that way. But toward the street, it has that Navajo blanket terraced grid implication that uh, is familiar in the Southwest and a very, very potent uh, cultural image. So the stepping patterns are related to that, um, the Serapi period of um, Navajo weaving was in the 1850s and 60s, and there's a relationship to that, both in color and geometry. <clears throat> there you can see one of the parking courts on the right. There's a chili string hanging off the wall. There's a story about this building that uh, extends beyond its present use, and I'll, I'll wrap up with a slide of that. An early sketch that explored the color layering, but not the patterning yet. Patterning came along later. This is the view from the, from I got in a concrete bucket and had them haul me up to over the treetops. This is the view looking, say, from the penthouse terraces across the trees of the country club toward the city and the mountains. I wanted to evoke the feeling of the Grapes of Wrath Voyagers from, that, from them on down the line in, in uh, this building of having this visceral connection to 66, um, a kind of uh, the power of 66 transmuted into this building, a reaffirmation of the scale of the old motels without, without trying to be too cute about it, um, and you know, very up-to-date apartment planning, very, very normal and conventional apartment planning, generous outdoor spaces, balconies, terraces, and so forth. The axon that preceded the model studies. That's a neon, and articulating the steps will be neon. If I can get it in the budget, it's going to be a cliffhanger. But all these steps would, would have neon articulation. I like Hollywood movies where neon glows through in a, a kind of a sleazy hotel window through a window shade and you have that diffused light. And I want the light like that to spill out of um, the parking course as you see it glowing out there on the right. And all this, um, this kind of zigzag reversal of light that happens at night. The model is uh, 18 feet long. It's our special effects team in action again. <laughs> I sent George Lucas a shot of Condominia Galactica and he actually replied and told me he liked it. I was hoping he would lay a, a commission on me, but he didn't do that. The, the, uh, the night light spilling out <clears throat> across the, uh, the parking lots. I'd love to cover these parking lots with sand so you have that, that Wild West imagery as you approach, maybe even occasional cow skull, but have I like the idea of cars leaving tracks that you can look back on. <clears throat> the poetry of 66. And the, these are the concluding images. And the one on the right is a competition for uh, Times Tower. I, I understand the school, maybe one class entered that. I didn't win uh, anything on it, but I got included in the exhibit at the Urban Center, which is on right now. Um, so I, but I, I haven't seen it, so I don't know what the winners were like. This, uh, I just want to use this as a vehicle for talking about um, urban design since I'm teaching jointly with uh, Arnie and Ron at Urban Design Studio. I think um, urban memory is important and Times Tower is in Philip Johnson's scheme for, for uh, as you know probably, for Times Square it goes away so that those uh, kind of uh, menopausal mansard buildings can uh, orient around a 
a, uh, a square. And I think the Times Tower should, should be recognized and charged with, with urban memory. I see it as a cloaked in light in a, you know, an advertising technology lighting, that, billboard lighting that you can computerize. So it becomes a storehouse of urban information, both graphic and, and, uh, and uh, verbal. And then in that under it, or over it, sheltering it, would be a, a laser-generated pyramid of light. And it, the, the entry was called the Great Light Way, play upon the Great White Way, a reaffirmation of the theater district in light, the, an urban icon in, in the sense that the, uh, um, Times Tower is preserved for posterity as a giant computer bank memory of urban events. And I'll conclude with that. Thank you very much.